Hi everyone, it's 10 o'clock, time to get started. I'm Nancy Langton, Associate Dean of Accreditation and Strategic Initiatives at the Lewis College of Business and the Brad D. Smith Schools of Business at Marshall University. I'm excited to be with you today. Happy New Year and welcome to the Herd Insight Small Business Webinar Series. We are continuing our webinar series from last fall with a new batch of informative presentations that can help the local economy and its small businesses. Today's event is the first in this new year, and we thank you for taking the time to attend this event. Today, we have a special event in store. It is titled, Will the Economy Recover? Impact on Financial Institutions and mm -hmm. Small Businesses. It features Dr. S Charles Skip Hedgebach, President and CEO of City National Bank. In conversation with Dr. Avi Mukherjee, Dean of the AACSB accredited Lewis College of Business and Brad D. Smith Schools of Business and Professor of Marketing at Marshall University since 2017. Dean Avi will set the stage for some intriguing and on-point discussions about how the economy and its outlook for recovery coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Skip will provide his perspectives on the potential recovery and the impacts it will have on small businesses. After the discussion, they will answer questions from the audience. Before we start the event today, I would like to say a few words about the Lewis College of Business and its mission, which is to promote economic development in the regional community and beyond. The college does this through five strategic priorities, including one, high demand curricula, two, leadership skill sets, three, experiential learning, external engagement and economic development, four, entrepreneurship and innovation, and five, a global footprint. The college is committed to supporting local businesses, our alumni and other stakeholders in re-engaging, recharging and redesigning their business models. In keeping with this commitment, we have developed this webinar series that will continue throughout 2021. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and use it to make yourself and your business more successful as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. I will now turn the presentation over to Dean Avi, who will introduce Skip and begin the panel discussion. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome everyone. Happy New Year. I'm proud to introduce today's featured speaker, Dr. Charles Skip Hedgeback. Skip has served as the CEO, president, and as a director of City Holding Company, which is traded on NASDAQ under the ticker CHCO, and its principal banking subsidiary, City National Bank, since 2005. City is headquartered in Charleston, West Virginia. He joined City as CFO in 2001 as part of a turnaround team. Prior, prior to joining City, he served as Director of Forecasting at Roche Diagnostics Corporation in Indianapolis uh, from 2000 to 2001. He was CFO of People's Bank Corporation of Indianapolis from 1995 to 1999. Skip began his career at Indiana National Bank in the Asset Liability Management and eventually managed the Funding and Asset Liability Committee Alco departments while chairing the Asset Liability Committee for NBD Bank, which is a successor to the INB. Skip earned a PhD in economics from Indiana University and a BS from Butler University. In 2018, he was named the Community Banker of the Year by the American Banker as a result of City's exceptional financial performance during his tenure. He currently serves on the Executive Committee of the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce, on the board of the West Virginia Bankers Association, on the Executive Committee of the Buckskin Council, and on the board of the, West, of the Mountain State Chapter of YPO Gold, which as you know, stands for Young Presidents Organization. He's a past chairman of the West Virginia Bankers Association, past chairman of the Thomas Hospital System based in West Virginia, Charleston, and a past treasurer of the West Virginia Symphony. 
Skip is not only a highly successful business leader, but also a compassionate supporter of higher education. He has supported student experiential learning at Marshall and other universities in the state over several years. I am delighted to inform you that Skip will be teaching a course in finance as a visiting professor at Marshall this semester. Next week marks the start of the spring semester at Marshall. What better way to ring the opening bell on the new semester than to have you, Skip, with us discussing how the economy and the world of banking and small business would look like as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you, Skip, for joining us today. The topic of our webinar today is, will the economy recover, impact on financial institutions and small businesses? Let me take a few minutes to first paint a broad canvas of the macroeconomic and societal trends and fundamentals. And then we will hear your take on these. It sounds a little bit like the tale of two cities by Charles Dickens. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. So what's driving the economy? I'll talk about three factors. First, we now have the vaccines. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that about 15.4 million doses have been shipped throughout the country. Vaccinations in the US began December 14 with healthcare workers. And so far, over 7 million doses have been given. 150,000 have been fully vaccinated. Some logistical challenges, of course, are still being sorted out. Second, there's also some help for Main Street. In December end, the $900 billion stimulus relief package was passed. Households received $600 for each adult and $600 for each dependent. Workers would be eligible for a $300 a week federal unemployment subsidy. The $325 billion allocated to help small businesses includes $284 billion for first and second forgivable paycheck protection program loans. The bill also includes $20 billion for economic injury disaster, for disaster loans. Third, with hope and optimism, the stock market continues to be on a roll. This past Friday, the S&P 500 rose to 3,824, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average advanced 1.6% to 31,097.97, and the NASDAQ Composite gained 2.4% to 13,201.98. Remarkably, all three indices closed Friday at their record highs ever. You know, I was looking at a statistic the other day, and it does look like a great disconnect. In 2020, the world economy as a whole tanked 4%, which is a lot, while the world stock market boomed by 13%. So this is something that has not just happened in the US, but frankly, all over the world. There are still major challenges, and I'll talk about three challenges, just like we talked about three forces of, uh, of, of positivity. First, while the stock markets are roaring, the virus is still raging, approaching 23 million cases and 380,000 deaths in the US alone. The US reported more COVID deaths and cases in the last week than any previous seven days during the pandemic. The United States reported more than 300,000 cases and more than 4,000 deaths in a day for the first time. Second, millions of out of work Americans are still suffering with an unemployment rate hovering at 6.7% compared to 3.5 pre-pandemic, and the economy losing a new 140,000 jobs in December, marking the first decline since the recovery began in May, with the decline in employment pretty much following the path of the virus. Third, a large part of the population are suffering from anxiety, stress, isolation, fear, and other negative emotions leading to an acute mental health crisis. The impact of COVID-19 has made financial security top of mind for many people. According to a recent EY Future Consumer Index, Ernst & Young, more than eight in 10 people are worried about their financial position and about one quarter believe they will be worse off financially in 12 months. 25% also anticipate it will take them years to get back to a position of financial stability. Understandably, a key concern is work insecurity with more than 70% of respondents saying they are worried about the impact of COVID-19 on their job. And so I start with the first question, Skip. With all these conflicting signals in the broader economy, how do you unbundle all this? Well, I, I think there are um, two 
uh, Tales of Two Cities hobby. And thank you for having me. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, and I'm excited about teaching finance. Um, I, before I start out, I'll, I'll say that uh, we've been hiring uh, graduates from Marshall for the last couple of years. Uh, I wasn't convinced that hiring 22-year-old uh, kids was the, the best thing we could be doing, uh, but we ran out of people we could uh, uh, steal from our competitors. So we tried it and we've been amazed at the uh, talent that these young people have been able to bring. Uh, and the Marshall students have been fantastic. Um, so I think there's really two um, tales of two cities. One is that we're experiencing two crises simultaneously. We're experiencing a health crisis uh, and an economic crisis, and they're different. We're all in the health crisis together. Uh, we all know people who, we probably all know somebody who has COVID right now. Um, most of us uh, on the call probably know someone who's passed away uh, from COVID. Um, we all are working in businesses where um, everything is different, uh, not necessarily financially or worse, um, but every, every business owner I know is stressed out by adapting to change, uh, by worrying about the people that work for them, whether they're financially doing well or not. Um, so there's a health crisis that we're certainly all participating in. Um, but there's an economic crisis going on at the same time, uh, and they're not the same thing. Uh, and in the economic crisis, uh, you have a tale of two cities, there are um, a large number of people who have been very, very badly hurt uh, by the uh, crisis. People who've lost their jobs, uh, small businesses that are struggling, small businesses that are gone uh, and likely will never return. Uh, and you emphasize that the unemployment rate, which was three and a half percent in February, um, not quite a year ago, uh, spiked to 14.7% in two months. Uh, that's a, a wildly high unemployment rate. And even in the Great Depression, the unemployment rate didn't go up like that. Uh, it went up, but it went up little by little by little over time, not in two months. And then the uh, economy has uh, recovered almost as quickly. And so today the unemployment rate is 6.7%. And that is a lot of people, as you said, who are unemployed um, that were employed a year ago. Uh, and those people are hurting, but we need to recognize that 93.3% of all Americans are working. And so while a number of people have been badly hurt here, a number of people have not been uh, hurt here. Lots of people have not uh, lost uh, their jobs. Um, most people, in fact, have not lost their jobs. Most people have not seen a reduction in their wage rates. Uh, many businesses uh, have been hurt, but many businesses have uh, not been hurt at all. Um, and there probably are fewer of those that could say, 2020 was a better year than 2019, but there are those businesses. I won't name them because we have a number of customers that fall in that category and they probably would prefer, given the uh, pain that everybody in America is feeling, they probably would prefer that people really not notice that they're doing really, really well. But uh, in, in any economy, some people are doing well and some people less well. And many, many, many businesses and many, many people who are have been hurt by the crisis have been hurt, but they have been hurt by um, limited amounts. They, they're doing financially relatively okay. So I can bring you some information from what we see in our customer base, um, uh, the, in our business customer base, in our consumer customer base to sort of demonstrate uh, that point. Um, on the business side, I could just tell, tell you anecdotally when I uh, talk to uh, business owners that I know, um, I would say that there are um, some that have done extremely well. Um, now, that doesn't mean they're happy or they're excited because they're stressed out just like everyone else. Uh, they may be financially doing quite well, but their business is completely different than it was um, a year ago and they go to sleep every night like we all do, worrying about themselves, their families, the people that work for them, the vendors that supply them, whether the business is gonna um, be the same tomorrow as it was today. Today certainly wasn't like it was a year ago. So they're stressed out, but there are a number that are doing fine. 
Uh, lots who are doing okay. They're not doing as well as they had hoped to be doing in 2020, um, but they're not, they're not in dire straits uh, by any means. And I would have to say among my own acquaintances, I don't know any businesses that are having um, enormous problems that are um, facing the possibility of uh, bankruptcy. Um, I have, we have clients that are having uh, those kinds of problems, but among my personal friends, uh, most of their businesses are doing at least um, okay. Um, so let's look at what our business customer, how our business customers are behaving. Um, and the reality is that very few of our customers, and I think it's true in the banking sector as a whole, are having trouble paying their bills, um, paying their, um, their, their bank loans, uh, interest and principal. And uh, that's something we can easily watch. Uh, doesn't mean that the customer is not under some stress, but they're not under the kind of stress that causes them to say, we can't make payments on our loans. We may be looking at bankruptcy. When the economic crisis took hold in April, we had a lot of businesses come to us and say, hey, I'm, I'm worried. I don't know what's going to happen. And um, we all probably remember that. I remember, um, I'll, I'll admit to um, being worried in March that I wasn't going to survive six months, that uh, we all didn't know what we were all facing, and it was pretty serious. And many of our businesses were very worried, and they came in and said, hey, we need help here. Uh, and they approached their banks, and the banks entered into deferrals with the customers and said, look, um, you, you either don't need to make payments at all, or you don't need to make uh, your principal payments, just make interest payments. Most banks are um, gracious to want to help their customers when their customers are experiencing stress. Uh, and so we had a lot of that in April, May. I would tell you that as the economy has improved, and the economy has improved significantly, 70% of the people who were out of work in uh, April are back to work now. Uh, and so as the economy has improved, uh, the deferrals in the banking industry have dropped dramatically. And really, we have very few business customers that are still in a position where they're not paying the original loan payments, principal and interest as originally promised. And so that's an indication that while businesses are, pro many businesses are under some stress, they're not under um, incredible stress on average which isn't, again, to say that some businesses aren't having um, phenomenal stress. Um, another way of looking at how the customers are doing is um, whether banks are seeing losses uh, in their loan portfolio. Customers that owe us money, and we're looking at them and saying, we are never going to get that. Uh, and in the uh, first quarter um, uh, of 2020, and banks were doing their first quarter earnings uh, reports in April. Many banks took uh, large reserves for potential bad losses. In the second quarter, many took additional reserves. And they did that because they believed that there would be lots of loans that would go bad. And if you look at banks' uh, actual loan losses in the second quarter and the third quarter, they were really very, very low. And in talking to the analysts who follow the banking industry, they're not seeing or hearing from bank CEOs across the country that there are large losses that are going to have to be uh, taken against the reserves that were previously set aside. And so that's an indication again that, yes, businesses are under stress, but the stress is not um, the kind of stress that leads us to think that large numbers of bank borrowers are going to be going bankrupt, I suspect, as people release their fourth quarter earnings uh, reports within the banking industry that we're going to see those banks unwinding those reserves. They're gonna say, look, um, the things that were done in April and uh, March by the government to try to shore up the economy were successful. Uh, the economy began to improve, it's gonna to continue to improve and we don't think we're really gonna have the losses that back in March we thought uh, might be possible. Uh, on the consumer side, I can talk a little bit about how folks are doing as well. In uh, March, April, we had the same concern for many, many uh, consumers who, uh, who have mostly mortgages with us, uh, who called and said, hey, I want to defer my loan payments. I'm not sure I can make my loan payments. That's normal for us. Uh, in the lives of Americans, bad things happen. You lose a job. Uh, you face the death of a spouse or even the homeowner. You face uh, a divorce. 
and you find yourself in a position where you can't make your payment, um, you call your bank and you explain things to the bank. And most banks' response is going to be, we're here to help you. So long as we believe you're eventually going to pay us back, we're going to help you. Uh, and so we had many consumers come in and ask for help, and we uh, deferred a large number of mortgage loans. And as the economy improved, people became more uh, secure that the future was uh, brighter than maybe we thought it was in March. Uh, and deferrals, and we always are deferring um, mortgages for, for people for various reasons. The deferral levels are now back to what they were in January of last year, indicating that consumers, at least in our West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, Virginia footprint are not a feeling incredibly stressed or they would be telling us by asking us uh, for deferrals. Uh, and the last piece of evidence we have about consumers is the amount of money in their bank accounts. Um, in April uh, and April, uh, May, the government, uh, as you talked about, issued uh, those stimulus checks. Uh, when they did that, um, hundreds of billions of dollars rolled into the banking system. And that was true at City. It all came in on one day. It was probably the largest uh, single increase in uh, cash we've ever seen or will ever see. Maybe uh, we might be having that come again, I suppose. Uh, and uh, cash balances uh, increased for our customers. Now, if our customers were on average under tremendous stress, uh, those stimulus checks would have been uh, quickly spent down on food, rent, uh, utilities. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported on this a couple weeks ago. Uh, depository balances in the US economy are uh, up uh, significantly. And we're able to look at our own customers and, and we can segregate those out. We can take out the business uh, checking account balances. We can take out the checking account balances of high income people and look at the checking account balances of the average American. And what we saw when the stimulus checks hit was that the average balance in, in the average American's uh, checking account went up by about 50%. And they have slowly uh, this is over uh, nine months. Uh, those balances have slowly declined. Uh, but even prior to the most recent stimulus, they still remain about 25% higher than they had been in uh, January, February of last year. So what that tells us is it's certainly true that some people are under tremendous stress, but the average American is not under uh, tremendous stress. The average American is going to work doing their job and bringing a paycheck home. So the economy is slowly improving. Uh, and uh, as the unemployment rate continues to um, in decrease, uh, the economy will continue to get better. And maybe I'll wait and I'll let you ask uh, another question, Avi. Yeah. So there are three things that you know I wanted to allude to a little more in detail. You mentioned those, and 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 those are all very important things. Number one, we saw sort of the tale of two cities. You talked about the second one, which is there are winners and there are losers. And you know there are sectors, as you as you said. I mean, it's really you kind of painted a picture that shows that there is recovery happening, which is really really good, because uh, you know the federal government with all the liquidity injection has really helped in proactively managing the crisis, probably for the time being. The question is, you know, what has been the role in the long run? If you can, you know, talk a little bit about what does this lead to uh, with more federal aid likely coming, you know, does that, um, you know, the, the inflation, uh, other forms of effect on the economy as we, as we move forward, that has helped, of course, individuals and many businesses, frankly, right through the worst of times in the crisis. Well, I can give you my own perspective, and you may want to follow up to be sure I'm answering your question. Um, in March and uh, April, um, when, th when we all really didn't know what was going to happen and what to expect, uh, the government jumped in with a couple programs, the PPP program uh, to assist uh, businesses and the stimulus checks uh, to uh, help individuals. And I think they correctly named that, those because their approach was, um, we have a crisis, we don't know how bad it is, we must help, uh, we must prevent the economy from totally decelerating, we must get money into the economy, uh, and they did that. And I remember being on a conference call with uh, Senator Capito, and I, and I, I said, Senator Capito, um, the 
the the PPP program, as you have laid it out, is going to go to be to uh, all businesses, some of which are under tremendous stress and going to be under tremendous stress, and, and probably some who aren't. Um, so it's not targeted as specifically at those who are having the most challenges. Uh, and the answer that I got back, which made good sense to me, was that um, we must do something now. Uh, the economy needs assistance now. We've got to get those stimulus checks went out and they went out quick. And they went to lots of people who work for our government, uh, none of whom have ever lost a paycheck. Um, they went to uh, up to 80% of the Americans who've never lost a paycheck. Uh, but the point was um, not uh, to, to take a year uh, analyzing the situation and targeting the money to the folks that were in the most need but to get the stimulus out there and to shore the economy up. Um, I agree with that. I think it made, as an economist, I agree with that. I think it made good sense in much the same way as the recession of 2007, uh, their government jumped in very quickly to shore up the banking system. Had they not done that, I'm not so sure the banking system in 2007 would have survived. Um, I remember calling um, uh, Joe, I think, and saying, Joe, if you guys don't do something, uh, people are coming in here and they're asking to take $100,000 in cash. And we said, what are you going to do with it? And they said, bury it in the backyard. The economy will not survive that. They did what needed to be done. Then they did what needed to be done in March, April. And it worked. The economy began to improve significantly. Um, the, this next round of stimulus checks and PPP, um, my personal opinion hmm, um, is... Um, I'm not not sure. I, I think they could have done a better job. Um, they did they did a better job in the sense that the stimulus checks are more targeted um, to people more likely to, to have had uh, challenges, but they're going to lots of people who have never missed a paycheck. Uh, the PPP loans are very much more targeted, uh, this time um, being uh, going only to businesses who can demonstrate that they've had uh, a drop in revenue. Uh, that's good that they're both more targeted. That makes sense uh, in an economy where most people are doing okay, but some people are doing terrible. And those are the people we really need to be sure we've helped. Had they started in a bipartisan way uh, to have talked about that in August and September, they maybe could have designed something that would really be good and really be targeted at the right people. Uh, maybe politically that's not possible. I'm not a politician, I don't know. Uh, what they're doing this time is at least better uh, maybe not as good as it could have been. I suppose that's true of everything. Sure. So, you know, I'll add on to another thing, which is the economic pundits have started debating the letter, right, best representing a potential economic recovery. You know, we talk about the, the L-shaped recovery, which is frankly almost not a recovery at all, but also W, uh, U-shaped, uh, the K-shaped, and of course the V-shaped. Your thoughts? I don't understand any of those shapes. I can tell you what I think will happen. Um, the economy has improved. Um, I believe it will improve rapidly in the next um, three or four months. Um, and here's why I think that's true. The vaccines are, are, uh, are getting out. 5% uh, of West Virginians have now been vaccinated. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it seems to me that by the end of February, probably most of the folks over 70 will have been vaccinated. Uh, that's where most of the hospitalizations are occurring. That's where most of the deaths are occurring. So when uh, folks over 70 have been vaccinated and hopefully eventually younger and more uh, people, the uh, hospitalizations, the death rates will go down dramatically. Um, this COVID, although it will still exist and it will still be bad, in, in my opinion, going to get talked about very much when uh, people aren't dying and when people aren't going to the hospital. And the economy, I think, will come uh, roaring back. In terms of the letter, not everything's going to come roaring back. Um, the, the airlines have shut down so many flights, mothballed planes, um, getting back to a regular schedule is going to take a long time. Cru cruise lines, if you want to go on a cruise, uh, the ships are sitting in ports, but there aren't people ready to go uh, and uh, wait on you. It's going to take a long time to get that ramped uh, back up. Uh, so certain sectors are going to be really, really challenged. So I think the unemployment rate will drop between now and June fairly quickly. 
economists are unwise making projections like that, I think, but I'm not an economist anymore, so I don't have to worry about that. I, I think it will improve fairly significantly, and then I think there will be a long, long tail. Um, I tell you, one of the things I really worry about is I really worry about all these small businesses. Uh, the small businesses that un, or the, the really small businesses, the, the person who works for himself uh, running a business, the person who has a couple of employees, and particularly those that have had significant stress or have gone under. A lot of restaurants probably no longer exist. They certainly aren't serving, and you can see boarded up restaurants. If, if several years ago you uh, took out a big loan against your house um, to follow your dream and open a restaurant, and you've been bankrupted by COVID, um, and you come to um, your spouse and say, well, the economy's improving, let's do it again. Um, we, we were basically bankrupted by COVID, but, but let's open another business. Are they gonna say yes? My, my granddad ran a, bu a bullet factory um, and uh, he and my grandmother skimped uh, to make that work. And he told me once, you know, you're not a small businessman until you've gone to the bank, withdrawn your savings to make your payroll. Um, and small business people uh, in America, that's what they do. And that's what they did uh, through the COVID crisis. If uh, my grandfather's bullet business had been bankrupted, grandma would not have let him start over. She wouldn't have let him. She would have said, look, you just need to get a job. We can't do this again. So I wonder how many of the small business people in America are gonna be willing to do it again. Um, and I particularly am worried about uh, the uh, political regime uh, and the possibility of more regulation and more taxes, all of which would discourage our small business owners uh, from starting those businesses back up again. And that may weigh on the ability to ever get back to three and a half percent unemployment. Um, I think that's a potential real world risk and maybe a place where our universities can help. Uh, but capital is going to be a problem for those small businesses um, who generally do not borrow from banks. They generally uh, self-finance those little businesses and uh, taking the flyer to give up the, the paid job uh, for the risk of starting a business, even one they're passionate about, may be just more than they're willing to do. That's great. Yeah, I did want to talk about small business in particular because that is the focus of this webinar. You already brought that issue up. Let me ask about uh, being able to hire and retain a skilled workforce under these conditions. Obviously the country's uncertain economic conditions is changing the way uh, people learn, You know, the labor pool uh, and the ability to hire and retain a skilled workforce under these circumstances. Yeah, I think that's that's difficult, and it probably has weighed on the prospects of young people uh, getting um, their first position. Um, I have um, um, four kids between 21 and 26, so uh, they have lots of friends, uh, and I can draw from their experiences. Some of those friends, having just graduated, have ended up with jobs, but not with the jobs that they would have expected to have gotten because the jobs that they uh, would have expected to have gotten would have required that they be mentored by someone uh, and taught the ropes. And so they're working, but they're underemployed for what they had hoped to do and their careers are starting off uh, more slowly. Uh, my daughter's boyfriend, on the other hand, uh, graduated and um, was hired uh, by a firm in Washington, D.C. in June. Uh, he's worked for them since June. He's never been in their offices. Um, he's never been to their offices. He was hired um, over uh, the internet, uh, all just like we're doing right now. Um, he works every day remotely. Um, the owner of the firm is very concerned about COVID and just said nobody's coming in until this is over. And that all seems to be going okay for him. So um, I think it can happen. My daughter joined one of the large public accounting firms. Um, she has never been to their office. Um, she was there before COVID to be hired. She uh, uh, started work on October 1st. She has yet to uh, be in their offices and she is working successfully and remotely uh, doing uh, audits of uh, insurance companies in Indianapolis. So. 
it, it's, I think it's tough. I think it's weighing on um, people, young people's career prospects. I think they are overcoming it. Um, COVID's taught us a lot at City uh, National Bank about working remotely. Um, I, I was always really against allowing employees to do that. Uh, um, City has a great culture. Um, people like working together. And uh, I, I was always encouraging of people to um, work in the office um, around people uh, so that they were part of the team. Um, and uh, we really didn't think people could work as effectively from home. But when COVID hit, we didn't really have a choice. We sent people home. And our uh, computer folks really didn't know whether they could pull this off, uh, but they did. And what we've discovered is that people actually can be, in many cases, more productive from home than they were at work, um, at least as productive. And we found that we can um, monitor them, hold them accountable for results very, very successfully. I would tell you, most of our employees don't want to be at home. Uh, they would prefer to be working from the office. They, the, our work is where we make friends. Um, there, there's a social aspect to that. There's a cultural aspect to that that people really enjoy. Uh, but uh, I think in the future, uh, our employees will probably do uh, some work from home um, and they'll morph back and forth depending on the circumstance. Most of the people uh, um, that I know that like to work from home or I'm hearing about are, are people for whom a com the commute is particularly difficult. So we've got several employees who live a long way from headquarters and we've allowed them to work from home and they love it because their commute is so long that it's really painful to get here uh, every day. Um, we have employees who prefer to work from home because they're having health care um, issues in their family, elderly relatives they're taking care of, or educational issues with uh, young kids at home. So I think we'll be able to uh, allow people to um, work from home. And we found the technology works quite well, and people can be effective uh, from home. Yeah, so, you know, kind of pulling it all together, the recession of 2008 to 2010 was triggered by a shock in the banking system. In fact, many economic downturns in the past 50 years, such as the stock market crashes, debt defaults had financial system origins. The current recession is different. It was triggered by a global pandemic, mostly externally induced, governmental and societal responses to it, and the resulting shocks to supply and demand. What we heard from you is that the banking sector has adapted well. There's a lot of things that you know, have, have been learned along the way. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, what is the future of work? I mean, you already talked about some of those trends, but also what is the future of banking in the post-pandemic world? You know, the role of technology, digital banking, remote banking, um, use of other forms of, I guess, technology and all this. Where do you see all this going in the future? So you're really curious just about the future of the banking industry? Let's talk about that. You already mentioned the future of work in general, yeah. Well, banks play a unique uh, role in the economy and I think that it is true that they always will. Uh, we do two things um, and those two things go together in, in a way that cannot easily be replicated. Um, and if you replicate it, then you become a bank. Um, on the one hand, we take deposits from consumers. Uh, we uh, keep their money safe. Uh, we, as, as economics 101, right? Uh, money is a store of value and we uh, help them use their money to affect transactional purchases. Um, and uh, on the other side, we take that money and we invest in business loans, uh, loans that require complicated underwriting loans that the market could not uh, readily um, um, provide on its own. Um, and it, it's a difficult for uh, a business to try to loan money uh, without taking deposits because uh, they don't have a uh, cost of funds low enough to be able to compete with the bank rates. There are businesses out there uh, that uh, loan money uh, to consumers for mortgages. Mostly their rates are higher than banks would charge. They're great at marketing, so they, uh, they, they certainly get customers, but they end up charging them more than the bank is charging. And most customers never notice because they don't, th those that go online never ask a bank for a rate, so they never discover they're paying more uh, than they would have to pay. 
Um, and, and so banks, I, I think, will always exist. They will transform because our customers um, need us less today, uh, need us fewer times um, a month or a year today than they did a year ago. And a year ago, they needed us less than they did 10 years ago. And that trend is not going to change. Uh, technology uh, provided us ATMs. Technology provided us debit cards. Uh, technology provided us... Uh, uh, these things um, where you can uh, bank on your phone uh, or on your computer. And, and so the industry is changing um, and that's going to continue, um, I believe, because the technolo technological aspects have been somewhat accelerated um, as a result of COVID, right? Customers um, have uh, learned new ways of dealing with banks that maybe it wasn't uh, their preference. I think that some people have really tended to overemphasize that uh, for their own purposes, uh, frankly. Um, the, uh, the lots and lots and lots of banks in America have too many branches. Um, and they have too many branches because they could. Uh, and um, those branches uh, with interest rates being low as they are today, um, and bank profits are, are down uh, in 2020 as compared to 19, they will be lower yet in 2021. Uh, with the Fed keeping interest rates nearly zero, low interest rates are not good for banks. And so banks are looking for ways to cut costs and they have found their branches. And many banks are saying, well, technology is driving customers away from branches. Well, a little due to COVID, yes, uh, but not a lot. That's a long-term trend for many of these banks. They don't have enough customers at these branches. They're saying, this is all about technology. It isn't true. It's really that their branches were never very profitable. Um, City has about twice as many customers per branch as the average bank in America. And because that's true, our branch, we're not gonna close branches because the customers still need and want our branches. Uh, branch, banks are telling you that they're gonna take uh, branches away because you don't need the branches anymore. You don't need them because you never, you never, never nobody ever did need them uh they're they're thinly used branches you're so you're going to see less branches in america uh over time and a lot less branches in america over time i believe you're also going to see because interest rates are so low if they stay this low and i don't think they will because i think as the economy comes back up the stimulus money uh the ppp money um government um spending programs are gonna cause uh, uh, enough of a recovery that um, there's gonna be inflation and interest rates are gonna have to go up. But if they stay low, you're gonna see community banks disappearing. Um, and I'm talking about small community banks, not banks the size of city. Uh, city, based on the number of customers is one of the 100 largest banks in America. Um, but the, well, there are 4,000 banks in America, most of them very small. And most of them in low interest rates are not going to be able to survive. They're, they're, um, they're pro while they're, they're not losing money, banks almost can't lose money, but they can't, they're not, they can't make enough to stay in existence. Banks only, do, banks only die when they make bad loans. Um, and if, in fact, we're not having bad loans in the COVID crisis, what the, the banks are going to just limp along. And so I think banking will change in that way. Well, there will be fewer banks and uh, fewer branches, but all the same services that consumers and businesses have uh, gotten in the past will continue to be available just from fewer locations. Very interesting, fascinating uh, picture of the future. And I think some of the issues that you raised are, are absolutely you know, really important things to, to think about and work on. With that, let's open up for questions. I know the audience, are, there's some questions coming from the audience and there have been some questions that have come before we uh, before the show. So I'll hand over to Nancy Langton for those questions. We can't hear you, Nancy. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thanks for your informative presentation today. It's going to help us all think more about how the economy and how its improvement or decline will impact financial institutions and small businesses. I'll now read some of the questions that were posted via the chat function during the event. <clears throat> the first question is, the strong culture you have at City 
has helped sustain the bank despite much more work at home. How, how do you continue to build your culture when people aren't face to face as much? I think that's mostly for Skip. Sure, um, I, I'm, I'm not seeing anybody at the moment. I'm gonna assume you can hear me anyway. Yes. Uh, the, um, that's really tough, isn't it? Because um, when you can't see each other, uh, each other uh, every day, it, it absolutely is straining um, the culture. And we are um, really focused on actually and planning now for uh, the time when we can uh, get back uh, in, in front of and with uh, people. Uh, with a lot of events um, to, to put our teams back together. In the meantime, I think all you can really do is, is uh, stay in close touch with people via phone and these wonderful various uh, Zoom, um, <clears throat> Zoom and team uh, meetings, um, which, uh, which helps a lot. We didn't use um, Zoom or team at all until the COVID crisis. We certainly learned uh, how to use those, but it's hard and every business must be struggling with um, a, a culture that um, is um, pulling away somewhat by not being able to spend time together. Okay, thank you very much. I have another, it's sort of a question, but maybe you have some comments on it. The person writes, I appreciate the remarks about small businesses. It is very true that we are suffering. One of the challenges is the fact that all relief is based on 2019 numbers and not the difficult and much lower income year of 2020. I have not received much help at all. Also, LLCs for some reason are getting less than other small businesses in West Virginia. So again, there's no question. Do you have any comments on that observation? Well, I think that the next round of uh, PPP is, in fact, uh, focused on um, customers who exhibited, um, at least in one quarter of 2020, a decline in revenue of 25% uh, as compared to the prior year. Um, so I think that the next round of PPP will be focused on trying to help those uh, people who have uh, taken hits. Uh, and lots of small business people have, absolutely. Probably probably the hits have been greatest in the small business world for large businesses. Um, the large businesses do stuff that probably haven't, haven't been hit. If you manufacture stuff, um, you're probably not facing the same challenges. People still needed what you make and you're still making it. If you're my barber, uh, you got a problem um, because you run your own little business and um, she doesn't have many clients, I would tell you right now. Um, she's hurt pretty bad. Okay, thanks. I have another question and this deals with your discussion about uh, consumers that they it appeared like for the most part they were maintaining loan payments, et cetera. Uh, this is looking into the future. Do you think households will fundamentally evaluate their willingness to take financial risk in the future? And how might that affect your bank? Uh, sure, they, they, they always will evaluate that. I think one of the reasons that uh, the stimulus checks came in in April and early May and uh, didn't get spent is consumers are worried or scared. Um, I, Avi quoted a whole bunch of statistics about people who about, are concerned about the future. Everybody's concerned. Um, even if you're not experiencing problems, when the economy is in turmoil, everybody asks, is my job safe? Um, they may think it is, but everybody's worried about it. And, and as the economy becomes obviously better, as the, the uh, COVID ceases to be uh, an issue and concern, I think that's when consumers say, oh, they breathe a sigh of relief. Um, they say, okay, everything looks like smooth sailing and they start spending money. I told my wife last night, I said, if there's anything you need to buy, uh, why don't you buy it now? Cause it's gonna be more expensive in the summer <laughs> because there's gonna be aggregate demand going up and there's gonna be, uh, as we've already seen uh, for some products, lumber prices are much, much higher uh, than they were a year ago because people are doing projects around the house. 
Um, so uh, as the economy improves, people will assess their situation. Um, most Americans uh, live uh, something close to paycheck to paycheck. Uh, so if they've got money in their account, there's stuff that they want to have. There's things they want to do. There's places they want to go. Um, and I think it will bounce back fairly quickly. But people will be conservative, uh, uh, rightly conservative, until they sense everything's okay. Okay. Another question taps into your earlier discussion about technology. And it says, banks will use the context of COVID-19 and the conditioning of digital, digital interactions to break the inertia of digital adoption of technologies like Bitcoin. How do you see that playing out? You know, Bitcoin is over my head. Um, Bitcoin, I, I believe, has applications uh, in the financial services industry, but they're not, um, from what I've read, they're not things that are going to have impact immediately. There's still um, lots of work to be done in that regard. So that, that's, that's really over my head. Okay. We have another one about PPP loans. It says, with PPP and second drawn PPP reopening for community banks today, what do you expect in terms of the number of businesses requesting these funds? So sure, I know you good. talked a lot about that, yeah. Good question. Uh, and, and PPP uh, is, I think, not open today um, at community banks. Uh, I believe that the PPP program op opened up at, a cup, at, at several um, um, non-bank financial institutions, um, and I, I think today and tomorrow, and then it opens up at banks uh, maybe Wednesday. Uh, and uh, I'm not keeping careful track of that, although if you're a city customer and you need PPP, all of our lenders and uh, branch managers do know the exact uh, timeline of that, but it's coming very, very soon. Uh, the, um, the PPP um, money um, is uh, one of the things I caution people to tell our customers is last time around there was great concern that there would not be enough money. Um, and I looked at the number of sm small businesses in America, the amount that they could get, and I said, there's enough. Um, there, there, there is enough money, and there was enough uh, money, and people were really worried about not being able to get it. They could get it. Uh, this program is smaller, um, but it is going to be enough because the only people who are gonna be eligible must have had a significant reduction in income. Um, and there are a lot of those businesses, absolutely. But there's a lot who are not going to qualify. Uh, uh, within my personal circle of friends, I have a, a number who uh, were eligible for the first round. They will not be eligible for the second round. And so um, the, the, um, the, the, the number of customers eligible is probably um, fairly similar because most, most small businesses are probably going to be eligible. I'm going to guess most small businesses have been hit fairly hard. The larger businesses, which aren't, you have to have less than 300 employees this time. Um, the, the larger businesses generally less impacted. So um, does that make sense? The, the, um, the, there will be enough dollars, but there are fewer dollars allocated because they don't anticipate. And they, have, they would obviously have some numbers on this, uh, that the demand will be as high because there will not be as many businesses who will qualify. Well, businesses who are not under significant stress will not qualify. Okay, great. Another question is about new forms of financial supervision and new responsibilities for banks. Do you foresee any of these emerging in the future? That would be a better question for somebody from the American Bankers Association, but I'll give you, give you a perspective. Um, I think the area that I've heard uh, the, the Biden administration may be interested in is additional consumer um, protection um, to be certain that uh, banks are, are uh, treating consumers um, fairly and equally. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, of banks are subject to a lot of those kinds of regulations already. 
Um, so I don't think those are things banks would fear. Um, bank regulation is interesting because most of the things that over the years government has promulgated um, that banks have fought and resisted, it is not the legislation itself that is the problem. Uh, generally, the legislation itself is something we can deal with. Um, the, the regulators uh, and particularly the legislators do not always understand the complication of implementing those regulations. They pass this law that sounds really good and has really good intentions. What they don't know is that most banks' computer systems were designed in the 1970s. Um, in fact, you could do that now far more efficiently, but when you run a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase and you're, um, you're a trillion dollar bank, uh, with several hundred thousand employees and with thousands and thousands of branches in multiple countries. Um, and you have this software that was developed and has been added to and modified and tweaked and improved and built over 40 years. Throwing it away and starting over is worse than just tweaking it again. And so we keep tweaking and they put in place a piece of legislation and they think it's easy and it's not easy because that legislation impacts maybe 10 or 12 different systems of JP Morgan Chase and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of coding language. And sometimes a little tiny tweak that seems like it should be really easy takes two years of programming to make happen. And so mostly banks understand why legislators wanna do things. Uh, what we work hard to do is to get them to understand that what they're asking is often way more complicated than, than they could have any uh, imagination. Okay, I have one more quick question before we close for today. You were talking earlier about uh, small businesses like restaurants having a hard time. How much do you think consumer, uh, consumer demand will drive that? For example, I know I used to go out for, for dinner an awful lot on my way home from work and you haven't done that since March. So uh, do you think that that'll be a positive, all this cooped up demand for some of these small businesses that maybe mom and pop will decide to take another go at it? Absolutely, I think consumer demand will be, um, I think uh, by June will be enormous. Um, I told my wife last night, I said, you know what, it's, if you want an airline ticket, it may cost you twice what it used to. If you want to go on a cruise, it's going to cost you twice. If you want a hotel in a fun place, downtown hotels are worried uh, about even summer. But if you want to be a hotel in Florida around Disney World, um, it's going to cost more than you were used to. If you want to go out to eat, because a lot of restaurants aren't going to be, aren't, are going to be bankrupt, it's going to cost you more. Um, consumer demand is, I think, going to take is going to be uh, enormous, and there's going to be fewer places to go to eat. Um, you'll pay more, uh, and as I said, I, I worry about the small businesses that couldn't make it, and whether they will ever um, come back into existence to help help with that supply. So I think you'll see a lot of um, uh, of constraints within the system where there's not enough stuff. Um, that we all want uh, when the economy is really uh, revving back up. All right, this wraps it up for our first Herd Insight Small Business Webinar of the new year. A special thanks to Skip for joining us today and being a part of this webinar series. We want to announce our next webinar that will be in two weeks from today on January 25th. It's titled Competing on Analytics, a a roadmap to creating business intelligence. It will feature faculty member Jingren Zhang and business professional Sky Raymond. Look for your registration email to arrive shortly. Please share the email invite with anyone you know who might benefit from this event. We appreciate your participation and always remember, we are Marshall. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Skip. Thank you, have a good day.